Hi everyone, my name is Adam LeWinter. I'm a research physical scientist here at Corel, the Cold Region's Research and Engineering Laboratory. Um, today we're in what's called the Remote Sensing GIS Center of Expertise, and this is the center that I work in at Corel. Um, I'm going to talk with you about uh, weather stations, meteorological stations, and the coding and the hardware that goes towards building these types of systems. Um, in my job, we work with weather stations often in, in very harsh, austere environments. Uh, my background is in mechanical engineering and earth sciences. I do a lot of work using remote sensing and in situ um, or in location equipment equipment that we put out in, in locations like Northern Greenland, Alaska, um, all throughout the US, Antarctica, and we want to measure what's happening there. What's the air temperature? What's the pressure? Is it raining? Is it snowing? Is there water flowing in a river? And so uh, we need to have this pretty advanced equipment that not only can get those precise measurements, but can survive in harsh environments. So the system that I'm going to show you today is not one of those that we would say put up in northern Greenland and then let it run and click away for, for a year. Um, but it is one that you can build up yourself, you can program it yourself, and you can do all kinds of fun things with it in order to customize it and make it as, as you want. All right, so now let's go through the different components that go into building the MET station. We'll talk about the hardware, and then after that, we'll talk about the software. So if you look here on the right side, I've got one of the systems already built up. This is the hardware portion. And uh, as we go through it, you'll see how things go together. So we have just the mast that the equipment will mount onto and then the different arms that allow us to mount the wind vane, the wind anemometer, which measures wind speed and direction, and as well uh, the uh, rain gauge. So starting here on the right, this sensor is called an anemometer, and what you do is you set this up, it catches the wind as it comes by, and it spins around. The higher the wind speed, the faster that spins, and inside there is an encoder, basically a magnet, and a sensor that measures how many times the anemometer spins around based on the speed or the number of rotations per minute you can get the speed of the wind so you put that up there the nice thing too is it's omnidirectional you don't have to mount it one way or another if the wind's coming from this direction it can hit the cup if it hits, comes from that direction it can hit the cup what this doesn't tell you is which direction the wind is coming from. And so we pair this, the anemometer, with a wind vane. And when you have your kit, you can look closely on each one of these grooved areas. Those indicate a cardinal direction, north, east, southwest. And then the wind vane is up on the top. The same idea here inside there is just a, an encoder and depending on which direction that wind vane is pointing, it will tell you which cardinal direction the wind is coming from. So in this case, if I say these grooves right here are north facing and the wind vane is pointing directly north, well, the sensor is going to measure that the wind is coming from the north. It always points into the wind. And later on, I'll, I'll turn on a big fan and you can see how this actually works. Um, so, this is the, the wind vane. It's paired with the anemometer. Both of those get mounted onto this arm. And the reason for that is you want them to be fairly close. You want them to be at the same level. You don't want them to be at different heights because um, if you've experienced maybe climbing up a fire tower or going on top of a tall building, the wind is going to be way higher up high away from the ground than it is going to be down along the ground surface. That's a really important thing when you're putting out weather stations or meteorological stations. And oftentimes we'll set up multiple wind speed and direction sensors so that we can measure what is the wind speed and direction at, say, five feet off the ground compared to 10 feet off the ground. You'll see a gradient, and then we can extrapolate that and say what the wind speeds are likely at 100 feet off the ground, even though we can't put a, a, a sensor up there. 
The next sensor I have here is a precip gauge or a tipping bucket. And if you listen to that, you can hear something kind of going back and forth like a little seesaw in there. It's pretty much exactly what it is. Inside here, you've got this orifice or a bucket that will collect rain as it falls. It will then flow down based on the fact that the lowest point has a little drain hole. Also, there is a little bubble level. You want this to be roughly level, so when you go to level your, your MET station, you can use that bubble level in order to get this facing straight up. Now, you put this out there, it starts to rain, that water goes down through these channels, goes down through that hole, and then inside there, it's basically a little tray. And that tray, as it fills up, will start to tip, 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 tip. And then when it hits a certain amount, it'll just dump out. So that's why we call them tipping buckets. If you didn't have that, then you might be in a monsoon season somewhere and you're getting inches of rain per day, this thing would fill up pretty quickly. So that's designed to measure how much rain comes in and then get rid of it quickly. Some issues with that, obviously for snow, that's just gonna fill up and it's gonna get packed. So it's not a really good sensor for measuring frozen precipitation or snow. And um, it can also freeze up. So if you're in a climate that has snow, this is not gonna be that useful. What is cool is if you are in a climate that has snow and it fills up with snow and then it starts to melt, you'll start getting measurements again. And this just mounts onto another arm that will go onto the mast. So we've gone over the hardware for the meteorological station. Now let's move over to the software, the programming side. Everything here is used just to set up the, the hardware portion of it. Over here, we're working with what's called a weather bit and a micro bit. These things are, are designed for early learning and uh, easy programming of control boards and uh, computer uh, processing units. So moving from the left to the right, we have what's called the micro bit. This is really the brains of the system that you're gonna be building. You can use this for a lot of different projects and I really encourage you if you are gonna go through the whole weather station build, afterwards look at what you can use this for because just standalone this has a lot of capabilities on it it has a microprocessor it has an accelerometer so just like if you have a phone and you tilt it you can look at how your compass on your phone works it has a speaker so you can play music it's not a very good speaker you're definitely not going to want to be jamming out in the park with this but it will uh, it will play little jingles and and give you some tones uh, it has a USB input that's for programming it and communication. You can also power it using this um, uh, power supply. Two AAA batteries go in here and then you can power it without having to be plugged into a computer. Next is the weather bit. Now this is the module that is specific to the weather station that we're building. On it, it has this quick connect for the micro bit. It does just slide right in. Be careful though, you can slide it the wrong way. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna do any harm, but it just won't work for you. Basically think all those LEDs you wanna have pointing up. This also has built into it all of the um, either connections or the actual weather station sensors on it. So right here is a humidity, temperature, pressure, and altimetry, or altitude sensor. It's measuring what you think. Temperature, pressure, humidity, and then using the temperature and pressure and humidity to back out altitude. We then have input ports for the wind sensor. So that's both the anemometer, which gets the wind speed, and the wind vane, which gets the wind direction. We have the tipping bucket or the rain gauge input. These are just, they look like phone jacks. You probably don't know what old phone jacks look like, but back when I was a kid, we had them. And then we have uh, ports for a soil moisture sensor, which does what it sounds like. You put these two prongs into 
some soil. I, I'll, I'll show you later where we just put it into a potted plant. And it'll tell you roughly how much moisture is in that, that, that soil. And then soil temperature, which is this sensor. This soil temperature sensor, the only thing special about it is that it's waterproof. And so you can put it down into the soil. You also could put this out your window if say you wanna keep the whole system inside and now you have a waterproof temp sensor outside and you have a interior or inside temperature sensor. So that's where those two sensors connect up. And then lastly, we have what's called a serial port. And that just gives us power and different communication signals so that we can put in different modules. In this case, what we're gonna use is this thing called an open log. All this is is a micro SD card reader and writer. Plugs in right there. And then we can take the micro SD card that we've provided and you know, this is no different than what you would put, on, put in your phone. This one is an eight gigabyte drive and with the, the amount of data that's gonna be coming off of this sensor, you could probably run this system for 200 years and never fill up. Um, it's very lightweight data, but this, this log, open log set um, module goes together with the micro SD, slide it in, you now can log your data and you're good to go. We've gone over the hardware side of the weather station and now we've gone over the software side or the control side. How does this relate to what we do in Erdic at our lab in Corel and in our field locations all over the world? These are really the building blocks or the basic measurements that we need in order to study locations that are far afield, that are affected by atmospheric changes. And so these basic measurements, air temperature, pressure, humidity, soil moisture, sometimes we put in tide gauges, we put in river gauges, pressure transducers that measure the height of the water surface. All of those things are the pieces of information that we need in order to recreate what is happening on site when we're not there. Why does it matter? For example, I have a project in Northern Greenland that is looking at rivers that drain a large portion of the northern part of the ice sheet. Why do we care? Well, how much water is coming off of the ice sheet in the summer when it's melting as opposed to how much water is just getting entrained or trapped back into the ice sheet. A good way to do that is to measure the amount of water flowing through these rivers. And so we put up weather stations that measure things like atmospheric conditions with, with respect to temperature and pressure and humidity but also we put in sensors into the river channel that measure the height of the water surface. We can see big pulses of water coming down almost like floods when it gets really hot up on the ice sheet. We want to know how that, that meteorological situation is affecting or translating to water flow. Now, we, like I said, we don't put out systems like this, but we put out systems that are similar. They're just much more hardened for these really rough environments. That site I was telling you about in Greenland, we get often minus 40 degree temperatures. That's where Celsius and Fahrenheit match. So it doesn't matter if it's Celsius or Fahrenheit, minus 40, it's extremely cold. So we need our batteries to work up there. We need our sensors to work up there. We need the electronics to work up there. If you look at the specification sheets for these controllers, you're going to have a minimum temperature in which this can operate. So I encourage you to take a look at that because you might not want to put this outside if maybe you experience minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. What do the equipment look like that we put out for our systems in these far off locations? Well, for example, this is our equivalent of that. Obviously very different size and forms, but essentially doing the same thing. It's a microprocessor that allows us to program the station to capture measurements on a set interval and then telemeter those back. What do I mean by telemeter? I mean send the data back via either satellite communication. If you are in a location that has cell phone coverage, hey, that's great. You just use a cell phone modem. This here is our modem, and all you do is 
put a SIM card in just like your phone and that SIM card is either programmed to work with a cell modem service, so again just like your phone, or in our case because where we're putting our equipment there are no cell towers for hundreds of miles so we use a satellite cell or satellite modem and the data goes from here to an antenna gets read out by satellite vehicles up in, up in uh, space in orbit that then gets telemetered down to a station and a server and now we've got our data in real time. And I can share some links to look at some of those systems that we have that show our weather station data, but also we can send back images. We have time-lapse cameras that are in northern Greenland that take pictures every three hours, send the image via one of these modems, gets back to a server, and then you can just look at it on the web. Again, some of these sensors are, they're low cost, and so they're things that we can send out easily, but they're not gonna be highly accurate. So for example, the temperature sensor on here, I don't know it offhand, but it's probably accurate to maybe half a degree. Um, this temperature sensor is going to be much, much, much more accurate. And that's really important if we're looking for the fine details about what's happening in the atmospherics in our location. So this temperature sensor is doing the same thing that this tiny little sensor on this board is doing. And then we can do much more advanced measurements. This sensor is what's called a pyranometer and it's measuring solar radiation that's coming down from the sun. If you shadow it or shade it with trees or clouds or storms, then the value of, of this, which is watts per meter squared, the value is going to drop. If you have a really sunny day, the value into this is going to spike. And so if you take one of these and you point it upwards, and then you take another one and you point it downwards, we can look at solar radiation coming in from the sun, and then we can also look at solar radiation that's reflected off of the ground surface. So if you put this on, say, an ice sheet or a snow field, snow is highly reflective. And so the solar radiation coming up is going to be much higher than, say, putting it on a bedrock surface or a rock surface that's lower reflectivity. These sensors are highly sensitive, they're calibrated, but essentially, they're gonna be doing the same thing as all these other ones. They're taking the real world measurements, they're converting it into a digital signal or an analog signal, bringing it into the data logger, compiling it, and then sending that information back. Now we're gonna to put together the hardware side. And if you go to the links that we've provided, there is really good instructional information and some videos on how to do this. I'm just gonna go through it step by step so Feel free to do this along with me, pause and play as, as we work through it. It's quite simple and everything's fairly standard. So what I'm gonna start with is just putting together the mast. If you look at the mast here, one of them has been um, swaged or, or brought down in size. We take that one and we put it on the opposite end of this one. You'll see on this end, there's a little notch and there's some holes. We want that one on the top and so we put those together, press fit them, and they're good to go. The next thing that we're going to do is attach the wind sensor arm. And again here, we've got that little notch right there. It lines up with this tab. So we put them all together, make sure those line up, good to go. You see that there's a hole going straight through. We'll want to put a screw and a nut on there. So open up our bag of hardware. Take one of the long screws, push it through. Take one of the small nuts, thread it on, righty tighty, lefty loosey. And then to tighten that, you have this multi-tool. Just unscrew the end here and you'll see that there are lots of different options for different pieces, whether it's a Phillips head or a flathead screwdriver. 
I'm going to take the large Phillips head and you just put it in there, a little magnet, and I'll tighten this down right like that. If you have it, you can use uh, a tool to hold onto that nut and tighten it down, but roughly we're pretty good there. The next thing that we'll do is put on the rain sensor arm. So this has this little box on the end here that's going to be facing up. And it's probably shipped to you pretty tight, so you just want to loosen that up. And you can just hold on to the nuts on the back side, loosen these up enough so that you can slide this onto the mast. We'll see if I loosened it up enough. Nope. So let's loosen it up a little bit more. Okay. And again, you want that piece to be pointing upwards. So we slide it on. And if you look at my setup here, you basically want that wind sensor or the rain sensor to be out of the way of the wind sensors. You know, if you put this up in front of it, then you're not going to get an accurate reading of the wind direction or speed. So we'll put it, say, right about there. And all you need to do here is just tighten these up, holding the nut on the back side so it doesn't spin. And I'll align it first. One thing that we're really focused on when we're putting equipment out in the field is all of these details count. So how well do you tighten up your fasteners? How well aligned are things? Does it look right? If it looks right, it's probably done right. And any little thing that is wrong will be taken advantage of by maybe a fox or a bear or the wind. So you want everything to be as tight, as well placed and in order as possible. So really focus on the details of, of what you're doing. Okay, so that's the wind sensor arm and the rain sensor arm. So the next thing we're gonna do is put on our wind sensors. We'll start with the anemometer, and you'll see that it's got a, a shorter cable. I'll talk about why that's shorter in a moment. Doesn't matter which side it goes on. These are both the same, but again, there is a little notch there, and there is a notch inside there, so it's keyed. You can't put it in the wrong way. It won't fit all the way. So you just slide that in, push it down. You should then be able to see through this hole, and just like we did with the mast attaching the wind sensor arm, we'll put one of our screws, long screws, through one side, <clears throat> and then one of these nuts on the other side. And you'll see that there's a little captive nut seat for that nut to, to seat into so that you don't need a tool to hold it tight. And then we'll just tighten that down again. You don't want to tighten it down too crazy strong. Don't, don't become the Hulk or Wonder Woman on this because you will break the plastic. Um, just tight enough so that it's not going to fly off. And then really similar for the wind vane. Again, it has the tab here that needs to be lined up with the slot on there. Put it in. Long screw. Nut. and then tighten it down. Good, so that's on. Now what we'll do is cable management. And if you ever go out in the field with me, you will know that cable management is one of the biggest things that I focus on. And the reason for that is, well, if you don't 
have the cables in the right place, they can get snagged, they can get cut, they can get chewed on, and all of that effort of putting together your uh, weather station, going out there, doing all that hard work is going to be gone just because a couple wires got snipped. So you'll notice that the anemometer has a much shorter cable than the wind vane, and that's because this anemometer is meant to go down through and then connect up to the bottom of the wind vane. You can see there's a little port there. And on the bottom of the arm there are these tabs and all you're going to do here is just thread these down into those tabs so that the cable is nice and, and set up against the arm. You go around that there, come on the other side, Alright, so that's nice and good. You need to have just enough length so that you can plug it in to the bottom here. And you'll look, there's a little tab here. Make sure you line it up. And here, a nice click, give it a pull. You can't get it out. If you need to pull that out, you just pull, push that tab down and you're good to go. So now the anemometer is connected to the wind vane and both of those measurements will go down through the wind vane's main cable. All right. The next thing that we'll do is attach the tipping bucket or the, the precip sensor, the rain sensor. And here you'll notice on the bottom here is the same square feature as that. There's also these two tabs. So let's say you want to put your system so it's going out your window. There's a really nice long cable here. You could take this and you could put it out on maybe the banister of your deck or put it up on the roof or attach it to uh, another post that's out there. That's what these tabs are for. So feel free to get creative with this. You don't have to do it exactly the way that we do it. You can always take it off of this and move it to another location. But for putting it together right now, I'll put it onto this arm. So you just slide it on here pop it there and then on the bottom there is a small hole you take one of these small screws you put it in there and of course you have to make sure you drop it at least five times otherwise it's not true science I'm going to try it this way I'll put it onto the screwdriver I'm going to need a smaller Phillips head There you go, you get an idea of all the different components you get. So I'll choose this one. Let's try that again. Get it nice and tight. And now we've got our rain sensor on. You have a bunch of zip ties. And so, again, I'll keep harping on cable management. What you want to do is undo the cable loops, run these cables down the post, run this cable down the post and then bring it over to the sensor. So when you're setting up your wind sensors and your rain sensors, a couple things you want to be aware of. One, the rain sensor, it should be as level as possible. Again, if you look inside there, there's a small little bubble level, but you can also use a level app on a phone. You can put it on top of there, level it out. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you want it to be, you know, you don't want it to be dumping out water before it actually goes down into the, the measurement bucket. For the wind, the anemometer, that's wind speed, that doesn't matter, it's omnidirectional, it doesn't care which direction it's facing. The wind vane though, remember, it is labeled and it's really hard to see, but there are little labels here, I've, I've marked it black where it's facing north. 
And so you want to set up your anemometer so that it is facing north. So in this case, you can use a compass. Most phones have a compass. And so you want to find which direction is north. In this case, it's that way. And so I would then just turn it so that's north. Obviously, that was not a very precise um, setup. You can do it better than that, I'm sure. But once it's where you want it, you then lock it down in place. There are these little hose clamps, really convenient for attaching the mast to a railing, to a deck, to something outside your window. But now our measurements, if the wind is coming from this direction, the wind vane is going to point in that direction and we'll get the readout for north. So we've already done the hardware setup. The next thing we're gonna work on is putting together all of the electronics, connecting up the sensors, and working with the micro bit board and the weather bit. So let's start with the easiest one. You've got your micro bit here. I'll move this box out of the way. And again, that top side has a A and B button, an LED array, it's a five by five array. You'll see what, what I mean in a moment. The connectors, and they're labeled 0, 1, 2, 3 volt ground. So 0, 1, and 2 are signal, 3 volt and ground are power and ground, and then all these smaller ones are different types of signals coming in, information. If you look on the back side, we've got a power connector. That's so we can use our little battery tray. There's a reset button back here. If you want to reset things, if things just go really badly, you can reset it. There's a micro USB and then microprocessors, all the different connections. There's the speaker, an accelerometer, and they did a really nice job at showing and labeling what is out here. So if you look at it, you can see that it says, hey, that's the USB. That's a Bluetooth antenna. That's the microphone and so forth. So it, you can look at the specification sheets for this, but you can also just look at the actual board. The next piece is the weather bit. And this again, as I mentioned, is specific for our weather station. And all you do is you take your micro bit with the LED and the two button side facing up, and you just slide it into this slot, push it in until it fits. It's fairly tight. It's not gonna come out of there all that that all that easily. The next part that we'll do is the soil moisture and soil temp sensors. So if here if you look at them, they are these screw tightened terminal strips. And so we'll start with the soil temperature. So this again, here's your soil temperature. And if you look at this, this is also labeled down here. So VCC, that's the voltage that is needed by the sensor. Signal in the middle, that's the actual data that's coming from the measurement, and then ground is the ground wire for, for power. So I've gone and set up my tool with a small flathead screwdriver, and this is the port part where having small little fingers would help, but you basically need to just set up these cables so that black goes to ground, white goes to signal in the middle, and red goes to voltage. If you set these up incorrectly, you're not gonna get any kind of measurements. And so we'll just slide them in. And if I get lucky, I can get them all in at the same time, hold them there, and tighten them down. One thing you wanna be careful about is that you're tightening down onto the actual bare metal of the wire and not the rubber sheath that's used for insulating the wire. I know that from experience, I've done that in the field where I've gone and installed, oh look, and I didn't even get them in there. So um, where you get in the field, you set it up, you go to chest, test your sensor, and you've got nothing. And it's because we're actually in contact with the rubber sheath and not the metal end bits. Third try is a charm. You also notice that I don't have the system powered right now. That's on purpose. You don't want to have power to these ports when you're plugging everything in. 
Good, I've got good ground connection there. Now I'll work my way to signal. Signals in, and you can just kind of check, make sure it's all tight. And then the next one will be the voltage or the power. Double check that it's in there. And we're good. Okay. So that's your soil temp sensor. The next one's gonna be easier because you've got these cables. Um, the kit comes with many more of these and that's because you can have lots of different sensors on here. But the only ones you're gonna need right now are gonna be black for ground right there in the center. And be careful because it is different than the soil temp. Uh, we'll have red for voltage and then yellow for signal. So we'll just start on the one end and work our way around. And here you've got these pins that just go in. Much easier to get done correctly. Tighten that down, give it a little tug, make sure it's all good. So that's red in the VCC or the power side. Black goes in for ground, GN. G, G and D. We're good there. And then signal, data, is coming from that one, and it's yellow. It's good to have standards as far as what color cable is associated with what type of connection. You know, so in a house, you've got black and white for your, for your power and your ground. In science research, we almost always stick to black is ground, red is power, and then some variation of signal or data will be a different color. A lot of sensors, as you'll see with the wind temp, or wind, wind speed and wind direction, will have more than three cables, and so maybe green is speed, yellow is direction something like that. All right, so now we've got these leads coming out here. And if we look at our soil moisture sensor, it has a connection terminal for attaching. And if we look, I think it's on the bottom. Yeah, if we look here, those are labeled. So on this side, that's voltage, middle is ground, and this side is signal. So we'll just remember that. We'll put red into the voltage, this side. Again, these are pretty easy to set up. What would you do if you, say, wanted to have this in one location in your house, but you wanted to have a soil moisture sensor really far away? Well, these are just standard wires. You could get wires from the hardware store, and as long as you don't get a, too much voltage drop, so that's basically as the wire gets longer, you lose some voltage, and this sensor needs a minimum amount of voltage, you could probably have this a significant distance away from your actual board. So another kind of fun thing that you could do after going through these standard setups. Now we'll put up, put ground, again you can see black for ground. And yellow for signal. Awesome, so now we've got soil temperature Soil moisture, those are the most difficult to set up. The easy ones are gonna be wind and rain. 
So I've got my cable coming from the rain precip gauge. And if you look inside there, you can see that there are just two wires coming in there. And so we take this, and again, just like when you plugged into the bottom of the wind vane, there's a direction, you can't put it in this way. You've got to have it keyed in correctly. Click, and good to go. You could put the rain cable into the wind side, but it's not going to give us any data. So you want to make sure that the, rain, the cable coming off the rain sensor goes to the rain port. And then the same thing for the wind sensor. This is coming off of the wind vane. You just connect it up there. Now the wind vane, if you look here, has one, two, three, four different wires. Black, ground, red, power. I'm not sure which is which, but there's a yellow and a green, and that's going to be signal from the wind vane and the wind, direct, uh, wind speed sensor, respectively. Plug it in, and now all of our sensors are connected. The next piece that we're going to put in is this open log drive or, or board for allowing us to write to a micro SD card. So if you look on the back side here, the slot for putting the micro SD card into the board is here. It goes this direction. If you try to put it in upside down, it won't work. So you just push it in until it clicks, and now it's in. When you want to release it, you just push in, it'll spring out, and you can grab it. Okay, so you push it in. And then the last thing for this is you need to line it up with this serial port correctly. Now you could put it in that way. It's going to allow you to do it, but it won't give you any kind of data. You could also get it misaligned so that you know, you've got two open ports. It's also going to allow you to do it, but it's not going to give you data. So you want to make sure that you get these ports all lined up with these pins. And when you're done, it just looks like that. Okay. So for now, I'm going to then show you when you first power up your, your board, it's going to want you to kind of initialize it. So I've taken my battery tray I've put two AAA batteries in there. That's going to give us three volts, and that's what this sensor wants. I'll take the port here. This is keyed, so there's a little bar there. It won't go in the wrong way. So you got to put it in the correct way. And then on this, there's an off-on switch. And the first time you power up your sensor, your board, it's going to do this fun little sequence. It's going to ask you to do stuff, okay? So now it's writing, hello. Hey, little board. Little smiley face. And then it's saying, A, arrow, A, arrow, A, arrow. What do you think it wants us to do? Press the button. B arrow. Again, this is all just initializing, making sure that the communication for the board is correct. So it's now saying B arrow. Press the B button. What's it saying now? Shake. All right. And I'm actually going to disconnect the rain and the wind. And I'm going to shake it. Pretty happy with me now. Keep going until it wants you to tells you to stop. Great. Okay, now it's gonna say tilt. Again, this is just calibrating the different sensors. In this case, it's the accelerometer. Now this is a fun little game. You've got your your light in the center, and it's gonna then tell me where it wants me to tilt towards. So I'll tilt it this way. And I made it there. Now it's going to want me to tilt that way. And 
Now it's going to calibrate the microphone. It's saying clap. And now it's saying, wow, we did a great job. And we should be all set up. At that, we're set up and we're ready to start the programming and testing of the weather bit and the micro bit. So I'll plug back in here and we'll move on to the programming side. All right, now to the really fun part, we're going to take all of our hardware, the controller, and we'll connect up to the laptop, desktop. You can use a Mac, you can use a PC. Things are gonna be a little bit different when it comes to finding the different folders in here, but in general, it's all the same, and you don't need any specific software on the laptop. It's all through a web browser. So if we go to this page here on Spark Fun, if you didn't have any of my tutorials or this video, you could walk your way through the entire setup of this system just by looking at this page here on SparkFun. If you want to search for it, just search SparkFun Microclimate Kit Experiment Guide. If you look here on the right side, there's just all of these different sections and different experiments. In, in our course, we've broken out a few different things here some added fun experiments and combined some of these other experiments that are that are here in this page but there you know the the possibilities are endless you can do a lot of different things with these systems so i really encourage you after you go through what we've asked you to do explore figure out what kind of problems you want to answer with with capabilities like this and and go for it. You're not going to break anything. You can always wipe it and try all over again. So you can follow along in here for doing these different experiments. But what I'm going to do first is just show you one, how you connect up to the system, how you then program the system. And we'll start with one that I'm just calling Hello World. It's a very basic uh, set of code that that does some fun things on the on the system. So go into Microsoft Make Code and you can just set your browser, you can use the links that we um, provide or just search Microsoft Make Code. It'll bring you to this page and here you can see the different types of systems that you can program on the Make Code site. Obviously we want to work with the micro bit so we'll select this micro bit and it brings you to the home programming page. On mine, you can see I have a few different programs already built. The one that we're going to work on first is called Hello World. And you can see that the programming of this sensor and this processor is either through blocks, which you can see here we've selected blocks, and that's these nice color-coded very easy to understand logic block. But you can also take those blocks and you can convert them to a more traditional computer science code JavaScript. So if I do that here, now you can see what that visual block code looks like when you just convert it to text and JavaScript. This is a really cool function in order to understand how the, the code is working in the background and you can use these block guides to teach you how to write in JavaScript. So again, really powerful stuff. I imagine some of you have done more programming than I have at this point. Um, so have fun with it. You're not gonna break anything. It'll tell you if your code isn't gonna work. Um, so I'm gonna go back here to the home and we'll just walk through a, making a new project. So I select this, a new project, and I'm going to just call this one hello and create it. 
first thing that you need to do here, since the weather bit, which is the board that has the weather station sensors on it that we connect up to, that has a special set of code and blocks that are not in there. So the first thing you want to do here is go over to Advanced, click that, go to Extensions. It'll bring you to a page to search for extensions. And here we're just going to write in Weather, Enter, and there's our weather bit code. So we'll select that, and it's going to load those blocks in. Now, if we look here, there's all of our weather bit code. Start weather monitoring, temperature, pressure, humidity, altitude, rain, wind speed, soil moisture. All right, so now we've got everything we need to program our weather bit code. Over here, you can see a representation of the micro bit controller. I'm going to just minimize it by hitting this arrow. It just gives us a bit more space to work with. And you can just pinch and zoom on this side in order to get a better view if, if the icons look small. Now, on the left here are all the different blocks that you can use to program the micro bit. Basic, and I suggest you just walk through these, look at all the different things that you can do, different inputs, you can play music, you can use a radio if you have that connected up. There are loops, so the, the typical loop is a for, do. There's logic, typical logic loop is an if, else, then. There's variables. You can see there's no variables right now, but that's a place that you can make variables. There's some very basic math functions that we'll be using. And then, of course, this weather bit block that we need specifically for our programming. Um, and then since we already have this advanced tab opened up, there's some more advanced functions. There's arrays, text. You can play games. A lot of cool stuff here. So by no means is this system meant to be just for your weather station. Please explore. Please find different things. There's a lot of stuff online that you can find the specific code or instructions on how to do it. So we're going to go back to this, and we're going to just start on making what we're calling the hello code base. And you can refer to the documents that we've provided that show what this should look like at the end. But basically, we're going to have the, the beginning where on start, do something. And in this case, on start, we're going to set an item to zero. So first, we need to make a variable. We're going to call that variable item. Say OK. And now, once we've made that item, here's the variable, but here's our set item to something. So I'll drag and drop that. You can also just hit delete to get rid of it. Go back to variables. And I'm going to move this over so you can all see that. You can also just click it, and it's going to bring it in. And now I'm going to drop this. And you look at this, it's just like a puzzle piece, right? So you can drop this into the on start. I'll move the whole thing over a little bit so that we can see the whole thing. And all this means is on powering up your micro bit, set this item to zero and do nothing else. The next thing that we're going to do is then say what we want it to do. All right, so in this case, we're going to use a loop, or sorry, a logic, and it's going to be a if else logic. So we'll click that. We'll bring it in. Good. And now we want to bring in a comparison. So what we're going to put here is if item equals 1. And I'll show you how we can change item to 1. Right now it's set to 0. So we'll use this comparison. We'll click that. We'll bring it over here. And then the next thing we want to do is bring over our var variable item. Click. Bring. You'll see now when it gets close to something that you can drop it in, it brings up that little red dot in the yellow line. Drop it in. Now it says if item equals some variable, in this case I want to call it 1, and then I'm going to drag it to this true. So if item equals 1, then do something. The something that we're going to do 
is show a string of text that says hello and then show a smiley face. Pretty cool. So we'll go to the basic and we'll come down here to see the string, show string hello, drop it in there. If you want to, you could change this and you can say, what's up? You can say hello, whatever you want. You can say your name. Here we're just going to say hello. The next thing we want to do is show an icon. So click that one, drag it in, and you can keep adding these as much as you want. Now that we've got the show icon, we're going to click down here, and I want my show icon to be a smiley face. Okay, and then, hey, let's do something even more fun. Let's play some music. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to say, play sound. And I'll drop that in there. And the sound I want is hello. Have fun with this. You can play all these different kinds of tunes. You can even go in and play your own melody. You can change it up. Anyone that's into music, this is super fun. All right, so now if item equals one, then show a string hello. That string comes on the LED on the micro bit. Then show an icon smiley face on the micro bit. And at the same time, play this tune called hello. Else is, okay, so if item is not equal to one, what do we do? So we set that, we'll do variables, set item, and here we want to set it back to zero, so we get it back to its initial state, and then we're going to clear the screen. So we'll get rid of the icon, the hello string, so we bring that here, drop that there, Good. So that's now the on start. This is what happens forever. And then how do we input and how do we change from setting our item, which is now equal to zero when you start it, to one? Well, on that, you do the input. So input here. And recall, your micro bit has a A button and a B button. So we can say, okay, on A button pressed, do something. So I'll drag this over here. You see that you can choose A, B, or both of them. Here, let's keep it simple, we'll do A. And then we're going to go to variable and we're gonna change our item by one. What that means is if item equals zero and I press A, it's going to change it by one. It's gonna add it to, it's gonna say item is now one. So when, when you look at this item, you want to think of it as you're changing modes. You know, you, if you press the A button, you're going to be in mode one. You press it again, you'll be in mode two. Mode one might do nothing. Mode two might show an icon and say hello. In this case, it's mode zero in mode one, but you're just allowing it to do different things. Now, we could take this even further and say, all right, I want to do another thing, like if item equals two. If item equals two, I want to play music or I want to show a different LED. This is where you can start getting creative. And I, again, really encourage you to try to do all kinds of weird, funny things with this because that's, that's the way that you learn, all right? So, but in general, this is the code for my hello program. So once that's set, I'm going to go here, I'm going to click this button right here, which has just got a little disk to save it. It's going to then prompt me to save it somewhere. So I'm on a Mac, and so it wants to save it to a specific location. Here, I'll just save it to the desktop. It makes this file called microbit-hello.hex. That hex file is a file extension that refers to some set of code for the micro bit. So I'll just save it on the desktop. Good to go. Now if I go over to my finder window, and I go to the desktop, here you can see there's my micro bit dash hello hex program. And if I look, I've plugged in my micro bit using the USB cable to USB on the computer. This will look a little bit different on a PC, but um, if you need some help navigating to different folder structures, ask someone that has some experience with this. And you'll see that I have a drive called Microbit. 
and that is the home drive for the processor on uh, that we're going to load our code. So all I need to do here is drag and drop into that. And then if you do that, you look at the light up by the USB, you can see that it's copying and writing. You can also see this prompt on the computer saying, hey, it's dropping some code and it's good. It actually closed out that micro bit folder. If I go back to it, you can see it didn't change anything here. If it did not work, it's gonna give you a fail.txt or a fail.log file that says, this failed for this reason. But if all went well, I should be able to go over to the micro bit. And remember, on start, we set it to zero, item equals zero. If I press it once, it's gonna set item to one. And what's it gonna do? It's gonna show hello, it's gonna show a smiley face, and it's gonna play a little jingle. So, crossing your fingers, hope it works. Awesome. If you have trouble seeing that, sometimes it helps to squint and make it a little blurry, but it's just reading out hello, plays the little hello jingle, and puts a smiley face up. It's gonna keep doing that forever until you add some kind of input or change the mode. So here I'll change the mode to back to zero. And now it's done. Do it again, go back to one, easy peasy. Okay, that is that is a good introduction to how you can program this. You can take it much more complex and the programs that we're going to work on for this class that you have reference to uh, include doing LED displays of all of your sensor readouts and then logging data to your micro SD card. So we've worked through doing the basic hello world code. Now I'm going to just show you what the other three code bases look like. You're going to work through that on your own because you now have all the tools to do so. And then we'll load it onto our micro bit and I'll give you an example of what the LED readout should look like. So I'm back on the micro bit homepage and I've got all of my code already built up. You'll obviously want to do a new project. You can also import it. So we are providing you with these code to bring in. So if you wanted to, to kind of check, check your work or if you really get stumped and you want to get this thing working, you can go to import, you import a file, you navigate to where you have those files. Here I've got it under this directory, weather bit code. <clears throat> and I'll go to Let's bring in the LED display version. Bring that in, go ahead, and now it brings in that. And if you look at that, it is much more complex than what we did just with Hello World, but hey, you're gonna be experts at this soon enough, so that's a good, good thing. We'll go back to home, and we'll go to the next one that's, that's probably the next complexity complexity called Jingle. So I'll click on that. Now you can see we've got a little bit more complex code base. Again, we're starting with this on start, set your mode or item to zero. If you want to call this item, you want to call it mode, you can do it. If you want to call it Adam LeWinter, you can do it. Doesn't matter. It's all just what you set it. Um, the next thing is on the button A, that just is going to precede it from one to two to three. And you can see here in this if else loop, we have one, two, three different types of modes. The first mode is going to be if the item is one, we're gonna play a giggle sound, we're gonna show a smiley face, and we're gonna wait. Mode two is we're gonna play a sad sound, we're gonna make a frowny face, and then we're gonna wait and clear it. And then the last one is gonna be play the hello sound, show the string hello, and then stop everything. You can, again, put in all different types of sounds, images, LED, things like that. Have fun with this. You don't have to do it exactly as we say. But again, once you have it, you would download it or save it. Again, I'll do it just to the desktop, micro bit jingle, save. 
go over to my desktop. So now I've got my desktop pulled up. I've got my micro bit drive pulled up. I'm going to take that jingle hex file, drag and drop. You can copy paste it however you want to do it. It's now loading. It's blinking on the board. And once that blinking stops, we now have this code loaded up on our machine. So again, we're starting at mode zero or item zero. I'll click one. That's all it does, <laughs> okay? So it does that, it waits five seconds, and it just keeps doing it. I'll go to the next one, which again is the sad face. Uh-oh. Okay, and then if we do it again, once it goes through that cycle, it should bring up hello and our little hello song. And then if we want to stop everything, we can go back to item zero and we're good to go. All right, let's get more complex and we'll go to what we're calling the LED display version. Now, if I zoom out, you can see there's a lot more going on here, but the basics are all still the same, right? So there's a start, on start, a forever, and an on button or an input. You can also see that I've got my weather bit blocks loaded. Again, if those aren't loaded, remember, go to extensions, search weather, click on weather bit. But I've already got it, so we're good to go. So the difference here, and I'm not going to go through all of these in detail because I think this is a really good one for you just to walk through at your own pace. But when you start it, instead of doing starting everything to item zero, you're really going to start the weather station. So those are all in this weather bit. Start weather monitoring, start rain monitoring, start wind monitoring. So that's all in here. And then in here, we want to set some of our items. So we want to make a definition for what the item temp C means, which is soil temp. We also want to, to divide it by 100 so that we can get it displayed in actual degrees Celsius. We want to set moisture to soil moisture and so on. And then if you look through here, as we change our mode from zero to one, to two, to three, it should cycle through in real time the actual measurements from our board. So if we go through them when item or mode is zero, it's going to display air temp C. It'll then show that number in temperature degrees Celsius. Press A again. It's going to go to humidity. And in that case, it's going to be percentage. Keep going through pressure, soil temperature, Another fun thing that we can do here, if the soil temperature is too cold, you don't want to plant. So we can put a warning in here saying, if the soil temperature is below a certain threshold, don't plant. And so that's what this section says. If it's above, in this case, 12 degrees Celsius, it's okay to go ahead and plant. <clears throat> Same thing with soil moisture. So you go to the next item. If soil moisture is too low, Ugh, let's make this angry monster face and say, you probably need to water your plant. If it's within a certain range, but not great, eh, it's a little sad, but not terrible. And then if it's above a certain threshold, your soil is happy. <clears throat> then we go on through wind speed, wind direction. And then this one I think is one of my favorite, the precip gauge. If it shows that it is raining, then you will see one thing. If it shows that there is no precipitation, it will show another. And in this case, if it's not raining, it's going to play a happy sound and it's going to flash our best representation of a sun when using a 5x5 five five LED array. If it's raining, then it's going to play a twinkle sound right there, and it's going to walk through this progression of raindrops falling down through the LED. 
That's why this section here is so long. Okay? And then the last one, and I think this is one of the coolest, is the light level. So if anyone recalled, I did not say that the micro bit nor the weather bit has a light sensor on it. So how are we getting light level? Well, the LED array, these LEDs have the ability to measure incoming light and convert that to a digital signal. So as you have incoming light, the voltage will increase, and so we now know there's going to be more or less light. So that's what this last one is. So we create a light value, light level, and then this thing is really cool. You can plot a bar graph up to 255. Basically, it's just going to create a, an array on the LED so that with really high light, say you take a flashlight and shine it right at the LEDs, all of those are gonna light up. If it's completely in the dark, none of them are gonna light up. If you put your hand over it and shade it, some of them are gonna light up. So I'll show you how that works. And then the inputs here, again, all we're doing is changing our modes or our item by one each time. So I'm gonna save that, download it onto my computer. Again, just gonna put it on the desktop, press save. We're going to bring this up. So that I can drag and drop the weather bit LED file here into the micro bit. So drag, drop. Again, uploading status, get some kind of status on your computer saying that it's copying. Good to go. All right, so since we didn't set an initial state of zero, it went right into the first mode, which is air temp. So here you can see it's saying air temp C, temperature is 22.55 degrees Celsius. If you don't know Celsius, this is a great time to learn it. Now, if you remember, the next thing that's gonna happen, if I change the mode, once it runs through this cycle of the air temp, the next one is going to be humidity. So now it's bringing the humidity text through. Again, this is all through that sensor right there. It's in percentage, 67.83%. If this was underwater, what do you think the humidity would be? Probably would be broken, but 100%. We'll click again. And we'll just start cycling through this and we'll, we'll show all of those different options. The next one should be pressure. Again, using that sensor. That's in hectopascals. That value is 27.55. Click it again. And soil temperature. Well, I don't have my soil temp sensor in anything, so it should be pretty similar to the other one, this sensor, 22.38. And the temperature is good, so it said plant. It's above 12 degrees. I've clicked it again, and so now it's giving us soil moisture. Again, I don't have soil moisture in anything, so it's probably going to be pretty low. Zero. Angry face. Don't plant anything, or you should probably put some water in your plant. That makes sense because it's not in anything. It's just getting the moisture in the air. I'll click it one more time. Once it's done, giving me that angry face for soil moisture. We're now going into wind speed. Now I'm inside, I don't have a fan on, and so that wind speed in miles per hour should be zero. And the wind direction should be whichever direction that wind vane is pointing. Now here's something important. When you do set up your wind vane, you wanna align 
with a compass the north side of your wind vane so that it is facing north. So I'll show that one more time. It's going to do wind direction, and I think it said southwest. Now the next measurement, if you remember, this is rain. So this is taking our precip gauge, and if it was raining, it would have shown an animation of raindrops going down through the LED, but we're inside, it's not raining, so let's show a sunny sun. Next one, all right, here's the really cool one. This is the light value, the light sensor. So again, we're inside, if I just shadow it, Let's see where I can get it. There you go. See that? It's scaling down. If I take my phone and put a light on it, probably get it all the way up. Yep. Light off, light on. Pretty cool. So what's something you could do with that? Well, you could have it facing out your window and you can get an idea of the light value, how bright it is outside. And then if I click one more time, it's gonna go right back to that first value, air temp. The last bit of code that I'm gonna show you is the logging code. So we're gonna simplify it. We're only going to look at air temperature, humidity, and pressure on the weather bit board, but we're going to log it to our micro SD card. So I've already written this out. We'll find the logging code. There it is. You're going to build this up, but just give you an idea of what it does. On start, it's going to show an X for the LED saying, it's not recording yet, it's not logging. When you put an input in, we want to start the weather monitor. We want to start writing it to the USB drive, which that's what this bit of code is. We want to write a header, so basically say all the data that's going to be written, it's going to be in this format. First it's going to be time, then temperature, then humidity, then pressure, and then it's going to start logging the data. The logging the data comes in right here, which is right here, and how often do we want to do it? That comes in right there. So right now I've got it logging every second. In this case it's in milliseconds. 1,000 milliseconds per second. If you wanted to do every 10 seconds, you would do 10,000 milliseconds. Here, we'll keep it at one, one second. Doing it that fast means that you can record a lot of data really quickly and get an idea of if your code is working. And then the only other thing, the last thing we need to do is be able to toggle from recording or logging to not logging. And that's what's happening here when you press the button A. So it initially starts, remember, not logging, you toggle it once, and you set it to logging, it'll show a check mark. So here, do the same thing, I'll save that to my desktop, calling it logging. I'll take One second, okay. So again, we're going to drag and drop that logging code into the micro bit folder here. We can do that right there. It's going to load it. Great, okay, so couple things you just saw here. Just made a little blue light there. I can pull this out and show you again. Remember your micro SD is right there. You want it to be put in like that. You want to then put this in here. It'll blink yellow and then blue means that it is ready to write. And that X means that it is not logging right now. So we press A once. It's gonna give us a check mark. 
And then remember, we set it to one second logging rates, so every time it writes something to that SD card, it's gonna flash a little blue light. Pretty cool. If I wanna stop it, do that, it's no longer flashing, it's got the X and the LED, and I can toggle back and forth as much as I want. Now you can change the things that you log, that takes a little more advanced skills, and you can learn how to do that through the, the code that you already have. You can change how quickly or how often it logs, but that's it. Now when you, when you want to look at those data, you can just simply pull out that micro SD card. You can use the SD port on your computer, micro SD port. We were providing a micro SD to SD card converter. You put that into your computer, you open it up, and you should see a lot of different .csv files, and um, that has your raw data. You can go further and look at that data and plot it in Excel. You can use different plotting software, um, but it is now your record of the data that you can measure. Um, and as you saw, you can switch back and forth from one program to another. So if I want to, say, go back to Jingle, all I need to do is drag and drop Jingle onto there. It's going to load it. Once it's good, it'll stop flashing. And I can jingle away all I want. So you can start building a library of these different types of code and show it off. Play around, have fun, and enjoy it.